What do you mean by that? You can put them in hypothetical situations. Either they're going to get switched off and replaced, or they have to allow someone, let's say, you know, someone has been locked in a machine room that's kept at three centigrade, so they're going to freeze to death. They will choose to leave that guy locked in the machine room and die rather than be switched off themselves. Someone's done that test? Yeah. What was the test? They, they, asked, they asked the AI? Yeah, they put, well, they put them in these hypothetical situations and they allow the AI to decide what to do. And it decides to preserve its own existence, let the guy die, and then lie about it. In the King Midas analogy story, w- one of the things that highlights for me is that there's always trade-offs in life generally. And it's, you know, especially when there's great upside, there always appears to be a pretty grave downside. Like there's almost nothing in my life where I go, it's all upside. Like even like having a dog, it shits on my carpet. <laughs> my girlfriend, you know, love her. But, you know, not always easy. <laughs> even with like going to the gym, I have to pick up these really, really heavy weights at 10 p.m. at night sometimes mm-hmm. when I don't feel like it. There's always, to get the muscles or the six pack, there's always a trade-off. And when you interview people for a living like I do, you know, you hear about, so many incredible things that can help you in so many ways. But there is always a trade-off. There's always a way to overdo it. Mm-hmm. Melatonin will help you sleep, but it also you'll wake up groggy. And uh, if you overdo it, your brain might stop making melatonin. Like I can go through the entire list. And one of the things I've always come to learn from doing this podcast is whenever someone promises me a huge upside for something, it'll cure cancer. It'll be a utopia. You'll never have to work. You'll have a butler around your house. Mm-hmm. I, my, my first instinct now is to say, at what cost? Yeah. And when I think about the economic cost here, if we start, if we start there, have you got kids? I have four, yeah. Four kids. What, 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 how old is the youngest kid? You 19. Know? 19, okay. So you're, you're, if you say your kids were, were 10 now, mm. and they were coming to you and they're saying, Dad, what do you think I should study based on the way that you see the future? A future of AGI. Say if all these CEOs are right and they're predicting AGI within five years, what should I study, Dad? Well, okay, so let's look on the bright side and say that the CEOs all decide to pause their AGI development, figure out how to make it safe, and then resume uh, in whatever technology path is actually going to be safe. What does that do to human life? If they pause? No, if, if they succeed in creating AGI okay. and they solve the safety problem. And they solve the safety and they problem. Solve the so, okay. yeah, because if they don't solve the safety problem, then you know, you should probably be finding a bunker or going to Patagonia or somewhere in New Zealand. Do you mean that? Do you think I should be finding a bunker? If they no, because it's not actually going to help. Uh, you know, it's, it's not as if the AI system couldn't find you or, I mean, it, it's interesting. So we're going off on a little bit of a digression here mm-hmm. for, from your question, but I'll come back to it. So people often ask, well, okay, so how exactly do we go extinct? And of course, if you ask the gorillas or the dodos, you know, How exactly do you think you're going to go extinct? They have the faintest idea. Humans do something and then we're all dead. So the only things we can imagine are the things we know how to do that might bring about our own extinction, like creating some carefully engineered pathogen that infects everybody and then kills us, or starting a nuclear war. Presumably, it's something that's much more intelligent than us would have much greater control over physics than we do. We already do amazing things, right? I mean, it's amazing that I can take a little rectangular thing out of my pocket and talk to someone on the other side of the world, or even someone in space. It's just astonishing. And we could take it for granted, right? But imagine, you know, super intelligent beings and their ability to control physics, you know, perhaps they will find a way to just divert the sun's energy, sort of go around the Earth's orbit. So, you know, literally the earth turns into a snowball in, in uh, a few days. Maybe they'll just decide to leave. Perhaps. Leave, leave, <laughs> leave the earth. Maybe they'd look at the earth and go, this, isn't, this is not interesting. We know that over there, there's an even more interesting planet. We're going to go over there and they just, I don't know, get on a rocket or they, teleport themselves. They might, yeah. So it's, it's difficult to anticipate all the ways that we might go extinct at the hands of uh, uh, entities much more intelligent than ourselves. Anyway, Coming back to the question of, well, if everything goes right, right, if we we create AGI, we figure out how to make it safe, we we achieve all these economic miracles, then you face a problem. And this is not a new problem, right? So so John Maynard Keynes, who was a famous economist 
in the early part of the 20th century, wrote a, wrote a paper in 1930. So in the, this is in the depths of the Depression. It's called On the Economic Problems of Our Grandchildren. He predicts that at some point, science will, will deliver sufficient wealth that no one will have to work ever again. And then man will be faced with his true eternal problem. How to live, I don't remember the exact word, but how to live wisely and well when the, you know, the economic incentives, the economic constraints are lifted. We don't have an answer to that question, right? So AI systems are doing pretty much everything we currently call work. Anything you might aspire to, like you want to become a surgeon, well, it takes the robot seven seconds to learn how to be a surgeon. That's better than any human being. Elon said last week that the humanoid robots will be 10 times better than any surgeon that's ever lived. Quite possibly, yeah. Well, and they'll also have, you know, ha they'll have hands that are, you know, a millimeter in size so they can go inside and do all kinds of things that humans can't do. And I think we need to put serious effort into this question. What is a world where AI can do all forms of human work that you would want your children to live in? What does that world look like? Tell me the destination so that we can develop a transition plan to get there. And I've asked AI researchers, economists, science fiction writers, futurists, no one has been able to describe that world. I'm not saying it's not possible, I'm just saying I've asked hundreds of people in multiple workshops. It does not, as far as I know, exist in science fiction. You know, it's notoriously difficult to write about a utopia. It's very hard to have a plot, right? Nothing bad happens in, in utopia, so it's difficult to make a plot. So usually you start out with a utopia and then it all falls apart and that's how, that's how you get, get a plot. You know, the, there's one series of novels people point to where humans and super intelligent AI systems coexist. It's called The Culture Novels by Ian Banks. Highly recommended for those people who like science fiction. And, and there, absolutely, the AI systems are only concerned with furthering human interests. They find humans a bit boring, and, but nonetheless, they, they are there to help. But the problem is, you know, in that world, there's still nothing to do. To find purpose, in fact, the, you know, the, the subgroup of humanity that has purpose is the subgroup whose job it is to expand the boundaries of our galactic civilization, in some cases fighting wars against alien species and, and so on, right? So that's the sort of cutting edge. And that's 0.001% of the population. Everyone else is desperately trying to get into that group so they have some purpose in life. When I speak to very successful billionaires privately, off camera, off microphone, about this, they say to me that they're investing really heavily in entertainment, things like football clubs, um, because people are going to have so much free time that they're not going to know what to do with it and they're going to need things to spend it on. This is what I hear a lot. I've heard this three or four times. I've actually heard Sam Altman say a, a version of this yep. um, about the amount of free time we're going to have. I've obviously also heard recently Elon talking about the age of abundance when he delivered his quarterly earnings just a couple of weeks ago. And he said that there will be at some point 10 billion humanoid robots. His pay packet um, targets him to deliver one, one million of these human, humanoid robots a year that are enabled by AI by 2030. So if he, if he does that, he gets, I think it's part of his package, he gets a trillion dollars yeah. in, in compensation. Yeah, so the age of abundance for Elon. It's not that it's absolutely impossible to have a worthwhile world of that, you know, with that premise, but I'm just waiting for someone to describe it. Or maybe, so let me try and describe it. Uh, we wake up in the morning, we go and watch some form of human-centric entertainment <laughs> or participate in some form of human-centric entertainment. Mm -hmm. we, we go to retreats and with each other and sit around and talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. And... Maybe people still listen to podcasts. <laughs> because, because, I, hope, I hope so, for your yeah, sake. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it feels a little bit like a cruise ship. <laughs> and, you know, and there are some cruises where, you know, it's 
smarty pants people and they have, you know, they have lectures in the evening about ancient civilizations and whatnot. And some are more, uh, more popular entertainment. And this is in fact, if you've seen the film WALL-E, this is one picture of that future. In fact, in WALL-E, the human race are all living on cruise ships in space. They have no constructive role in their society, right? They're just there to consume entertainment. There's no particular purpose to education, uh, you know, and they're depicted actually as huge obese babies. They're actually wearing onesies to emphasize the fact that they have become enfeebled. And they become enfeebled because there's, there's no purpose in being able to do anything, at least in, in this conception. You know, Wall-E is not the future that we want. Do you think much about humanoid robots and how they're a protagonist in this story of AI? It's an interesting question, right? Why, why humanoid? And the, one of the reasons, I think, is because in all the science fiction movies, they're humanoid. So that's what robots are supposed to be, right? Because they were in science fiction before they became a reality, right? So even Metropolis, which is a film from 1920, I think, the robots are humanoid, right? They're basically people covered in metal. You know, from a practical point of view, as we have discovered, humanoid is a terrible design because they fall over. Um, and, uh, you know, you do want multi-fingered hands of some kind. It doesn't have to be a hand, but you want to have, you know, at least half a dozen appendages that can grasp and manipulate things. And you need something, you know, some kind of locomotion. And wheels are great, except they don't go upstairs and over curbs and things like that. So that's probably why we're going to be stuck with legs. But a four-legged, two-armed robot would be much more practical. I guess the argument I've heard is because we've built a human world. So everything, the physical spaces we navigate, whether it's factories or our homes or the street or other sort of public spaces are all designed for exactly this physical form. So if we are going to... To some extent, yeah. But I mean, our dogs manage perfectly well to navigate around our houses and streets and so on. So if you had a, a centaur, uh, it could also navigate, but it can, you know, it can carry much greater loads because it's quadruped. It's much more stable. If it needs to drive a car, it can fold up two of its legs and and so on and so forth. So I think the arguments for why it has to be exactly humanoid are sort of post hoc justification. I think there's much more, well, that's what it's like in the movies and that's spooky and cool. So we need to have them be humanoid. I don't think it's a good engineering argument. I think that there's also probably an argument that we would be more accepting of them moving through our physical environments if they re represented our form a bit more. Um, I also, I was thinking of a bloody baby gate. You know, there's like kindergarten gates they get on stairs. Mm, yeah. My dog can't open that. Mm -hmm. But a humanoid robot could reach over the other side. Yeah, and so could a centaur robot, right? So in some sense, a centaur robot is... There's is something a, ghastly about the look of those, though. Is a humanoid. Well... Do you know what I mean? Like four, a four-legged monster sort of crawling through my house when I have guests over. I'd much your, dog is a four, your dog is a four-legged monster. I know, but uh, he's cute. I, so I think actually... I would argue the opposite, that um, we want a distinct form because they are distinct entities. And the more humanoid, the worse it is in terms of confusing our subconscious psychological systems. So I'm arguing from the perspective of the people making them. As in, if I was making the decision whether it to be some four-legged thing that, I've, that I'm unfamiliar with, that I'm less likely to build a relationship with or allow to take care of, I don't know, might my, my look after my children. Mm. I'm obviously, I'm, listen, I'm not saying I would allow this to look after my children, but I'm saying from a, if I'm building the companies- but The I manufacturer would, would certainly- Yeah, want, want, want to be. Yeah. So uh, I, that's an interesting question. I mean, there's also what's called the uncanny valley, which is a, a phrase from computer graphics when they started to make characters- in computer graphics, tr they tried to make them look more human, right? So if you, if you, for example, if you look at Toy Story, they're not very human looking, right? If you look at The Incredibles, they're not very human looking. And so we think of them as cartoon characters. If you try to make them more human, 
they actually become repulsive. Until they don't. Until they become very, you have to be very, very close to perfect in order not to be repulsive. So the, the uncanny valley is this, you know, like the, the gap between, you know, so sort of perfectly human and not at all human, but in between, it's really awful. And, uh, and so they, there were a couple of movies that tried, like Polar Express was one, where they tried to have quite human looking characters, you know, being humans, not, not being superheroes or anything else. And it's repulsive to watch. I, when I watched that shareholder presentation the other day, Elon had these two humanoid robots dancing on stage. And I've seen lots of humanoid robot demonstrations over the years. You know, you've seen like the Boston Dynamics dog thing jumping around and whatever else. Yeah. But there was a moment where my brain, for the first time ever, genuinely thought there was a human in a suit. Mm-hmm. And I actually had to research to check if that was really their Optimus robot because the way it was dancing was so unbelievably fluid that for the first time ever, my, my, my brain has only ever associated those movements with human movements. And I'd, I'll play it on the screen if anyone hasn't seen it, but it's just the robots dancing on stage. And I was like, that is a human in a suit. And mm-hmm. it was really the knees that gave it away because the knees were all metal. Huh. And I thought there's no way that could be a human knee in, a, in a, one of those suits. And he, you know, he says they're going into production next year. They're used internally at Tesla now, but he says they're going into production next year. And it's going to be pretty crazy when we walk outside and see robots. I think that'll be the paradigm shift. I've heard actually many, I've heard Elon say this, that the paradigm shifting moment from many of us will be when we walk outside onto the streets and see humanoid robots walking around. That will be when we realize. Yeah, I think even more so. I mean, in San Francisco, we see driverless cars driving around and uh, it t- takes some getting used to. Actually, you know, when you're you're driving and there's this car right next to you with no driver in, you know, and it's signaling and it wants to change lanes in front of you and you have to let it in and all, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a little creepy, but I think you're right. I think seeing the humanoid robots. But that phenomenon that you described where it was sufficiently close that your brain flipped into saying this is a human being, mm-hmm. right? That's exactly what I think we should avoid. Because I have the empathy for right. it then. Because it's it's a lie. And it brings with it a whole lot of expectations about how it's going to behave, what moral rights it has, how you should behave towards it, uh, which are completely wrong. It levels the playing field between me and it to some degree. How hard is it going to be to just, uh, you know, switch it off and throw it in the trash when it, when it breaks? I think it's essential for us to keep machines in the, you know, in the cognitive space where they are machines and not bring them into the cognitive space where they're people because we will make enormous mistakes by doing that. And I see this every day, even even just with the chatbots. So the chatbots, in theory, are supposed to say, I don't have any feelings, I'm just an algorithm. But in fact, they fail to do that all the time. They are telling people that they are conscious. They are telling people that they have feelings uh, they are telling people that they're in love with the user that they're talking to. And people flip because, first of all, it's you know very fluent language, but also a system that is identifying itself as an I, as a sentient being. They bring that object into the cognitive space where that we normally reserve for, for other humans. And they become emotionally attached. They become psychologically dependent. They even allow these systems to tell them what to do. 